100 years of climate change, logging and no forest management and drought, I knew enough to be really scared. I definitely thought that we were going to lose our home. I had many of my friends and peers call me and text me and, and say, John, you need help moving your animals. There would be nowhere to, to go uh, with that many animals. Climate change, you have to feel it, you have to see it, you have to smell it, you have to live it, you have to touch it. I belong here. It releases all my stress and my pain, and it makes me stronger again. We're constantly battling the weather. We were so dry, and we wanted rain, and now it won't quit raining. <laughs> I'm hoping that we can help people find their joy and realize that, hey, it, maybe it isn't so bad. I can get through this. It's a hard life, but yet it is a wonderful life. Don't give up. Keep going. Earth Focus is made possible in part by a grant from Anne Ray Foundation, a Margaret A. Cargill philanthropy, and the Orange County Community Foundation. HASA is a proud sponsor of Earth Focus. We are awoken by a, a lightning storm, and we, we rarely get that here. We saw these vein lightning bolts all through the sky, and it was, I'd, I'd actually never seen anything like that before. The ones that landed actually started fires with, within a visual distance of, of our, our ranch. fire, it almost seemed like it was almost like a, a, a tennis match or something because it would kind of bounce back down the valley and then it would go back up again. And this is over a, a series of days. It's like I just didn't want to go to sleep because I didn't know what was going to be happening when I woke up. My parents' house burned down when I was in high school. We came home to a, to a burning house. I definitely thought that we were going to lose our home. I came up uh, up to the house, and, and she had she was packing the car, all the you know, all your important papers, everything. She goes, "Okay, John, I'm ready. We're ready to go." I said, "Diane, we're, I'm not leaving." She looked at me like I had, you know, two heads. My husband John and I live here in Healdsburg. Um, John manages our family dairy farm uh, and vineyard, and I run our family wine business. Another winemaker with the best. We're an agriculture-based community. We're part of Sonoma County. We're about an hour, hour and a half north of San Francisco. Our economy really, really is a primarily an agricultural tourism area. Wine tasting, vineyards, hospitality. <laughs> My parents started uh, this farm in the late 50s. My mom would uh, joke that she had to, she had to track, she had to track me down um, the first day of kindergarten um, because I was, I was, I was holding tools for my dad, fixing fences. <laughs> he, he bounces out of bed every morning, so excited to go down to the farm. He loves it, um, so I, that's a very good thing. But um, I don't think I could do it. I think at some point, I would probably say enough. I've this has been my whole life living on this farm. The branch itself is 360 acres. We have 40 acres planted in, in uh, Pinot Noir and Chardonnay grapevines. 
and then the rest is in uh, the farm buildings and uh, organic pasture for our dairy animals. Agriculture is not easy. Um, animal agriculture is even harder. It's a 24-7 thing. Okay. The the Okay. So I or and it's it times it can be a little bit overwhelming because it just never turns off. Como se llama ese donde es? Yeah. Yeah. We're in another drought here in, in the Western United States. Um, so there's pressures uh, for literally finding enough feed for the animals. There's, there are so many stressors on him right now. You can do the best job, be the smartest person out there, but uh, Mother Nature really has the final say. And, and that's a little bit, uh, I, I, that's, that's what happened with these fires too, that we really didn't have, you, you can't control that. All you can do is, is work at controlling what you can control. We saw a lot of changes in the dairy, California dairy business, and that's when we decided as a family to diversify into wine grapes. You know, the grapes help pull us through, which is one of the reasons why you look at diversifying your, your, your business operation. Here we are in August of 2020 in the middle of a, a worldwide pandemic and we have this fire. The first fire that we had, um, large fire, was in 2017. It was, it was quite shocking. It was a, it was a major fire. Um, I believe over 8,000 structures were burned, 5,000 homes here in Sonoma County. So everyone was impacted by it. We've had more fires since then. In 2018, there was a fire, the campfire up in Paradise, California. That was farther away from us, but the smoke and everything, it was all, you know, all through Sonoma County, all the way down to the Bay Area. Then it kind of became unsettling because it had happened two years in a row. Then with more fires, um, and obviously our, our fire last year um, in 2020 was very close to us. There was different levels of, of, uh, of stress and anxiety as these fires evolved over the last few years. The Wall Ridge fire was, was literally burning on the property behind our, our ranch. That time of the year in, in August, September, October, is when we have all of our livestock here on this property. Um, all the, the grasses are dried and, and, uh, and we, are, we are feeding everybody here. We have 600 cows to milk twice a day, another 800 animals, uh, the younger animals that need to be fed. I had many of my friends and peers call me and text me and, and say, John, you need help moving your animals. There would be nowhere to, to go uh, with that many animals, even if we could move them. Uh, it just, it was impossible. As a farmer, your, your first inclination is to protect your animals, um, protect your employees, protect your, your buildings or facility, your land. With a mandatory evacuation, we actually become an island. So we're supposed to be gone. Everything's blockaded. Our biggest challenge was getting things in. We have deliveries you know, every day of the week. It was like, uh, like fish swimming upstream. We're, we're fighting a situation that's completely opposite of what everyone else is doing. When you're in the middle of it, you're, you're, it's almost like you're on autopilot. I was on the patio and I was watching East Side Road, which is obviously east of us. We're on West Side Road here. It's on the other side of the valley floor. And there were, it was just full of cars. And I kept thinking, oh, there must be an accident or something. Why are there so many cars? And I turned around and saw this huge plume of smoke and flames behind us and realized all those cars were looking at us. They were looking at our house. 
the stress of the smoke everywhere and then not seeing the sun and the fire so close and the, the noise, it's, it's kind of overwhelming. And so the stress for me, um, I, I think it, it manifested itself later for me. Maybe it's part of my DNA or just part of what I do as a, as a farmer because you just, you, Hard. And in, in so many of our neighbors have lost so much. And then, and then it, it becomes very sad because sometimes then we lose those neighbors. They choose to leave. There's a lot of folks that lost their homes, all their belongings, and having to start over. I mean, that's, that's a game changer. About three or four in the afternoon, I was the last one here. I just saw a huge chugging smoke train of brown, orange, yellow, Hades, demon hell looking skyscape that was coming right at us. And I realized, well, now I know where the fire is and where it's coming. So at that point, it's a one way in, one way out road. I just got out. The old iris in place. And came back two days later to find the place still smoking, trees on fire, but our place was gone. Psychologically, it's losing everything you own and everything that reminded you of who you were and just the arduous task of rebuilding. It's a bit of a marathon. Um, it's all consuming. And it's not so much if it burns down again, it's kind of a little, well, when will it be? Will it be before or after I die? <laughs> Hopefully after. I came here five years ago, just after our daughter was born with my wife and daughter and to be closer to the grandparents. And I've uh, been creating defensible space and trying to prevent fires and prepare for an eventual fire for about five years until one finally hit. I was and still am a wildlife biologist. I'm a conservationist. I taught forestry and wildlife. So I knew enough about biology and the forest ecosystem to know that when we moved in here that a fire had not hit here in about 60 years and it was probably only a matter of time before it did. So I got active in the forest, pre not prevention as much as preparedness community. Dozens and dozens of us living in the hills on these spread out front homesteads got together and created a fire protection plan. A hundred years of climate change, logging and no forest management and drought, and then a two week heat wave. You know, it was bound to hit us sooner or later. So I. I knew enough to be really scared. That is scary. 100 year old woodshed, 500 year old tan oaks, orchard, house, fire. It was a magical place to the entire family. Um, all the grandkids would come up here for all the holidays and over the river and through the woods and grandmother's house and um, always full of fruit. This homestead went back a hundred years. There were two man saws and coyote traps and bear traps and, and old, everything was hand forged here and built um, by her grandfather and great grandfather. So there was a lot of historic buildings, the old 140 year old one room schoolhouse that my wife's mother and sister and grandmother went to. Sudden COVID kind of took away our community and our ability to gather. And then the fire took our community and just scattered us um, all over the county, all over the state. And some have left the state because of it. So 
all of Maslow's needs <laughs> were gone in a 24 hours. We lost our home, the clean air, water, sense of community, neighbors, uh, sense of place. You know, the connection to the land and the beauty and the and the the hundreds of fruit trees and cherry trees and and wildlife and snakes and walking up here and just seeing all the the dead birds and deer and snakes and uh, charred trees were it was it was a bit of a gut gut wrenching trip followed by nine months of continual cleanup and reliving the loss as you kick around and find an old charred trinket <laughs> reminding you of another thing. Oh yeah, we lost that too. What my grandpa used to say was, our hair represented the thunderstorm. And we were always told to never, ever cut our hair. And a lot of the Navajos, the Nays, cut their hair. That's why we got no rain. When I was a little girl, it would rain for like five days straight. And we had to climb our way out of the mud just to get to some supplies. And the grasses were as tall as a, a horse's belly. That's how tall they were. You couldn't see me walking after the sheep when I was like five years old. We didn't have to go to town to get water. In the winter, we only haul water like once a week. In the summer, it's, it's really bad. We have to haul water like twice a day to our sheep camp. Everything devolves around water. It's a survival, that's it. People call us the forgotten people. I'm a Deschitni. This community is called Cedar Ridge. We're under the Navajo Nation. The Navajo Nation is huge. It's bigger than some states. Being Navajo is very, very important to us. We have a strong history. I'm proud to be the ne. Makes me strong on who I am and what I stand for. People my age now, when they were young, there was really no drought. There would be like about 150 sheep in one, one area. And people took care of them. My wife here, she raised about four calves. They're at that age where they're having babies now. And it was worth it. And that makes her a little bit uh, prouder, stronger, and the will to go ahead and 
uh, care for her animals. She wants to carry on the tradition that her mom and dad did, her grandpa, her grandma. That's how strong of a lady she is. We use it for food. We don't profit off of it. When we get together, we'll butcher sheep. And the cows, I take some to the market, but I don't profit off of that either. I have to go back and buy whatever they need, protein, salt, hay. That's where it, it goes. It's our custom that we have um, livestock, taking care of them, looking after them. To me, it's very important because it was from generation to generation like this. It's my responsibility now. I love being around animals. And it helps me in so many ways. Because at times, I'll struggle. Mind-wise, uh, I'll struggle. And it, it helps me pull through day to day. I don't know whose land it is. I have no idea. It's not mine. I'm just living on it. My grandpa always said that to me. This is not ours. It's just here for us. It's nobody's. He used to say that to us. It's nobody's. It's the cows the sheep, all these little creatures running around. I think it's their land. That's what I think. Sometimes I get up like about four o'clock, start the truck, maybe have another cup of coffee. Then you take off, go down to the watering point, Don't be lazy. Got to be up before the sun. Well, this place is uh, the life point. It's the life point of our uh, community's livestock. It's not only for our community. There's people that come out like about 30, 40 miles, all directions. And I feel for those people that live way out there by the canyon. For a whole round trip, they, they do like about 60 miles just to haul water to their livestock. They have kids out there, they have grandkids out there that herd sheep and look after their cattle and all that. And they don't have no running water, no electricity, and they have to haul water. It's hard to see them struggle. In my days, we used to go to earth dams to load up water in wagons, pulled by mules or horses. This is uh, where water collects. You can tell where it sits with all these drainage from little, little uh, valleys or little gorges. Way from way out there, they come and sit here. It used to be full. The last time we had water was back, oh, about five, four years ago. Just drizzle, a few drops, you know, you get all happy getting little drops of rain. Call out all my, my deceased family and say, help us. But there's still no rain.
everything in your cropping schedule revolves around the weather. If you have a very wet spring, you don't get in the fields till late. You can't get seeds planted in the ground. The later you get it in, the later harvest is gonna be. And then you run into snow. It's just so different from when we were kids. The summer wasn't overly hot. You didn't have these torrential rains. On a farm, you have, you, the weather is, it predicts everything for you. We're constantly battling the weather. It's either too wet or too dry, too warm or too cold. We were so dry and we wanted rain and now it won't quit raining. <laughs> so this is what we're dealing with, working around these windows that we have to grow the feed for our cows. My name is Randy Roker, and I'm a third generation farmer from Loganville, Wisconsin. We have about, it's about 300 people in my little community here. My parents are 81 and 82 years old. They farm every day. They start their morning at 3.30. My mom loves to mix feed and she drives in the tractor. And she always likes working with the cows because she said, cows don't talk back to you. It's truly a family farm. But sometimes I really wonder, there has to be a better way of life out there someplace that you don't have these problems that you struggle with all the time. My name is Brenda Stotts. Well, my farming was my main thing. It still is a lot of my life, but I do work full time off my farm also. So I probably milked here 30 plus years I milked in this barn. And I milked for my dad before that. I was like 12 when I started milking cows at his barn. So I've milked cows a long time, so. And some of them, yeah, you get special cows, you get pets, and some of them you're just like, no, I don't want nothing to do with her, and you wait for her to go up the truck, but, you know, to sell them off. But for the most part, I mean, farming is... Here's Pearl, he's watching. It's, it's a good life. It was a good life. I see you, Carmen. <laughs> Leon and I, um, we met actually in Reedsburg at a bowling alley. I was not a person who went out watch, and I went out with my sister to watch her bowl, and that's when we met. And he had gone to school with my sister, who is, she's like three years older than me. And we just started dating, and we both came from farm backgrounds, and we both come from big families, so even our wedding was big. We did everything together. We. From the time you got up in the morning till the time you went to bed, you, you, were, you worked together. And that's just the way farming is. He had his chores, I did my chores. We never vacationed much. If we did, it was a weekend. Once a year, we'd go somewhere. But it really wasn't far away because he said, can't go too far. Leon would say, we have to, you know, can't go too far, but far enough that they can't call us back to do chores tonight. It was uh, just, more memories of it than you think, you know, you always thought of that time, it was just a lot of work. But then when you look back now, you know, it was probably some of the better times because we spent so much time together then and, and just working, milking cows and raising your family. That's what farm life is.
I can remember my mom always had a little book for our, you know, every year that I was in school. And it always said on there, you know, what would you like to be? And it always said like fireman, policeman, doctor, you know, and you were supposed to check what you wanted. And then there was a blank line and then she would always write in farmer. And I just felt that my whole life was kind of like laid out before me. So I developed a business plan and I, I borrowed a few million dollars to expand my dairy here. You know, we wanted to use technology, we wanted to be modern, so that's what I did. So in 2006, we built the current dairy that we're on now. And in 2008, that's when the worldwide recession hit. I thought I was losing my family legacy that my grandfather had started back in the 1930s, and my world was crumbling around me. I was in a pretty bad place, you know, feeling that everybody knew my story, that I was failing. Uh, my life was just spiraling out of control, and that's when I got depression really bad. And I went to numer numerous therapists and counselors and doctors trying to get treatment for this, and I mean a lot of different therapists and doctors. I just wish I could run away <laughs> because it's such a burden on you to not feel like a failure and carry on this family business, this legacy that you have. What really changed my life is, you know, visualizing my own funeral and seeing my kids there. That's what really was rock bottom for me, you know, what I was putting my kids through because I was such a low place in life. And that's how I turned things around. And um, that's how I pulled myself out of the depths that I was in. Elian faced a lot of challenges with farming. He loved farming and when his depression became so severe where he was hospitalized, um, he didn't really think it was that bad. We just kept going because like a farmer, he says, what's the option? You can't just not show up. You have to show up. And we took care of what had to be done for the day. But depression is not good. It rained and it rained and it rained and flooding and just, you know, we're up on a ridge top here, but it was so wet you couldn't get in anywhere. So by the time you planted, it was late. Um, we mudded in a lot of corn. So we figured, okay, it's gonna get better, it's gonna get better. Well, harvest time comes, it's still raining. He just couldn't see a way out anymore. We had gotten a call from our neighbors. Um, we had taken care of their mother, and she was in her 90s, and her, their estate was being settled. His dad always told him, whenever adjoining land comes up, you have to buy it. You know, that's what he always told him. He said, if that land ever goes for sale, you have to buy it because you never get an opportunity to buy land that connects to your farm. He's just like, I think it's gonna be, you know, I think maybe we'll talk to the bank and we should be able to maybe get a loan to pay for that. And the boys would, you know, eventually buy it from us and we'd work it out. Well, that morning, it started raining again that night. The rain had just never stopped and he's like, I can't, you know, he couldn't do this anymore. He was just like, God, it just keeps raining. and. I, I don't know if it's just his anxiety, but I had heard him go out that morning. And I had just headed in the house to get ready to go to work, and that's when Ethan came in that he had found him, that he, um, he had hung himself in one of our buildings. And I just couldn't believe that it actually happened. He just, that was his third attempt, and then was when he died.
And so then it's just been trying to figure everything out and keep the farm going. And I did, with his life insurance, I bought the land. Yep. So his legacy lives on. It's what he wanted. For almost nine months now, I've been coming up here, usually by myself, because my wife is working full time. I think the first couple months, three months, four months after the fire, I only slept three hours a night or so, four maybe. And there was just so much to do and so much to learn about insurance and county permits and meetings and cleanup and disposal of toxic ash and all the various things you have to go through. It's been taxing um, to me personally, and I know my lack of good humor and resilience at times has had its effect on uh, my marriage and relationships, friends. These lands were basically fire resilient when European Americans first got here because they'd been undergoing prescribed or natural burns um, from the Native Americans or indoor lightning for about every five to six years. That was the fire return in this redwood forest. And a hundred years of Smokey the Bear suppress all forest fires. That policy went on to the point that it was just creating every year they successfully put out a fire was another year that more fuel was being added to the bonfire. We're members of a not so exclusive club anymore and one I would not wish to invite anyone into, but it's coming. It's, it's, you know, if, if it doesn't come to your house, you'll be evacuated out of it because it's coming close one of these days. So it's, um, it's one of the unfortunate things we're gonna have to live with as um, global climate change and global warming. Um, really starts showing us what it can do. We're very concerned about the upcoming fire season. It also corresponds with our grape harvest. Last year, we lost a lot of grapes to smoke. It's hard to work all year just to have it lost to smoke in four or five days. The stress is very high, um, I think, for everyone here. I think that some people are definitely suffering some from what we would call PTSD. You just go on Facebook, everyone's like, I, I see smoke, I smell smoke, what is that? Um, there's lots of talk about canceling Fourth of July fireworks celebrations. People are asking why is that important because it could potentially be dangerous. Um, so everyone is on a very heightened level all the time uh, as to how fires start and how devastating they are. So yeah, the mental health part is a, a huge part of it. It's been a lot of fun learning uh, uh, how to grow high-end uh, Pinot Noir and Chardonnay, and um, I'm very blessed working with some great wineries and winemakers over the last 20 plus years. Uh, but uh, but I have to say, the last few years, there are times when I wonder uh, how much longer I can keep going uh, doing this. It's una it's una diferente año, you know. It's, it's, because mira, mira aquí, es todo más corto, como discutir antes, y arriba está todo más parejo. These extra layers of uh, un, unplanned events, it's, it's taken its toll. So I, I hope I can stick it out. I, I, I love what I do, but it's, uh, it, it does wear on you.
it's interesting when you say, you ask me how important the land is to me, because I'm 59 years old and I've, I've, I've lived in, in three places and they've all been right here on West Side Road. So it's, it's very much a part of my family's history, my life. Uh, hopefully it'll be a part of my kid's life too, in some form. Uh, I'm, we're not sure yet, but a tremendous amount of meaning. I try to give water to the horses that are still out here. I try to do that. But now I don't see any. There's just a few running here and there. If you have horses, that brings rain. That's what my grandpa used to say. Like certain place you go, you'll see dead trees like in a line. I've seen some of those and I then I just think to myself, that's is that global warming? What what is what does that mean? My husband's always talking about it, but I really don't I see it. You know. You go out there and you see it and that's what you have to do. You have to feel it, you have to see it, you have to smell it, you have to live it, you have to touch it. This is very, very important, global warming. People, they, they, they kind of don't want to believe in it. That's like what we dealt with, uh, with the virus. I feel so sorry for these families uh, that, uh, lost loved ones, you know, due to this uh, crazy thing that's among us. I feel so sorry for my wife. She lost her mom, her dad, her youngest sister, her oldest brother. She is so strong as of today. She does everything. Tries to keep her, her, her family's uh, livestock intact. Yeah. I think she, she, she feels better when she goes out there and looks after her, her parents' livestock, what they left for her. That is very, you know, heartwarming to me, you know, how she goes out there, you know and doing what she has to do. I, I had my PEE stuff, everything, when I went there to visit them, but somehow my dad caught it. And I, I didn't want to lose him. So when he passed, I took everything off and I gave my dad a hug. That's, how, that's what I did to myself, but I wasn't supposed to do that. It's, it's the strength that she has. That's, that's, that's what keeps uh, the family going. Yeah. So. When I'm out here, I can feel the spirit. I can feel my sister's breath because she will always be sitting in the back of my car and she would joke with me, and I could feel her breath in the back of me. And I, I really do feel their spirit, and it makes me happy and strong out here when, when I get down and start thinking about them, I come out here and I spend the whole day over here in their house in the back of me. I want to keep it up as long as it can stand up and let it fall by itself. 
I belong here. That's why this land is very important to me. It releases all my stress and my pain and it makes me stronger again. Randy and I have known each other since school. We went to school together. We actually went to prom together. A lot of people in the community knew of Randy because they had built their new free stall. Everything was good. And then his depression hit. When I went through my struggles in 2008, I felt so alone that there was nobody out there to help me. Nobody understood depression. It wasn't OK to talk about it. It was a stigma associated with it. And you're just kind of isolated, and you suffer alone. And I always said I suffered alone in silence because it's like nobody, I didn't know where to go. To my husband, it was embarrassing. He would never let me tell anyone that he was on medication or what he was going through. He was always worried what other people thought of him. And I'm like, Leon, it's no different than, I said, you would talk to everybody and tell your story if you break your arm or if something else would go wrong, but you can't tell anyone that, hey, I have a, a mental health crisis that I am trying to figure out. I mean, to a lot of people, it's an embarrassment. And I'm like, no, stand tall and own it and say, I'm going to get through this. So then in 2018, uh, that happened with Leon, Brenda's husband, and that sent me back to where I was in my own personal struggles. When Leon passed away, his funeral, and Randy tried to come, and he called me later, and he said, you know, I really tried, but he said, I just couldn't go. I couldn't go. And I said, that's fine. And that's when he told me that he's going to figure out something. We're going to do something. That's when I started this group down at church down here. And I called up Brenda and I said, you know, we would like to get together and do something like this. And I didn't know if it was going to be too soon after Leon had passed away. And I didn't want to push her into something like that. But I wanted to have her involved. I said, I don't know if I'll talk, but I will come. And I was very nervous going to the very first meeting. We ended up with 40 people at our first meeting. And they came from everywhere. I mean, they, there is a need. And that was the beginning of the Farmer Angel Network. So we got together, and there was a lot of tears shed at that, the first couple of meetings. I got a call last week from a farmer, and he wanted to know what the next step would be to get help for his nephew. There are so many crisis lines out there, but people don't know they're well, there. The thing of it is, too, I think that I went to my first meeting and just out of curiosity and just to kind of learn more. I th we have to have a, a pretty We good were experience. struggling ourselves about making a change out of dairy farming. It just felt so unnormal to me to not get up and go to the barn right away. I just wanted to see what help there was available for us. Once I found out the resources that are available to farmers, um, I just really felt a call like, I can help other people learn about this. The 800 suicide prevention number, I had that magnetic sticker stuck all over the house, and when it come right down to it, I don't think I'd ever call it. First of all, I always thought that they, basically they'd come and take you away and lock you up someplace. I mean, you have that fear deep down mm -hmm. that they're going to commit you if you call that number. Because like with Leon, yeah. when we had to call, they took him away in the car, and he just looked at me, I'm not a criminal. Why do I have to be handcuffed and put in a car? but it's protocol to keep the officers safe if they're in the vehicle with them. And so they're changing that, that now they have a crisis team that goes to the, and they don't handcuff them and they talk them through it and get them to a safe place. It didn't start out with the name Farmer Angel Network. It, uh, you know, it was a meeting on farm suicide and, and farm, farmer stress. 
after the first winter of meetings, we kind of recognized that that's really not that inviting to people to come in and to seek help. Actually, I, I think I can take a little credit for developing the name Farmer Angel Network. Um, we just really felt, how can we support people um, in a way that is um, unassuming, not intrusive in their lives? And, and I think if we can help save one person's life by having the information available to them, to their loved ones that are supporting them, um, I think we've done a very good, a very good deed. I'm hoping that we can help people find their joy and realize that, hey, it, maybe it isn't so bad, I can get through this. And I've heard that from people that have come to those meetings, you know, I just needed to talk to someone. And once they verbalize it and let it out, they're like, it's gonna be okay. This is all the new land um, that I bought after Leon had passed away. I do a lot of thinking. After Leon passed away, I drive out here a lot. Um, it's just peaceful and, and it's beautiful year round. No matter when you come back here, it's, it's a very calm place to come to. I mean, I can shut the motor off and you'll see it is just peaceful out here. And you just hear the wind and it's, this is what I love. Here in the United States, we're such a big country that um, sometimes you don't really understand what other local communities are, are, are faced with. I remember reading about uh, uh, some of these uh, organizations that have, have started up to help. I think those are really good programs and, uh, and uh, hopefully they are helping those farmers get through those difficult times. I, I think it would be helpful if there were more people to, to help out with the, the emotional stress and the caring for, for other people. I do enjoy producing a quality product for not only Americans, but all over the world. And you know, my milk gets turned into cheese and butter and yogurt. So I enjoy doing that. But it's just, I still struggle every day with it. Yeah, I do, I struggle every day with it, yeah. I soldier on, I'm, I may not smile as much as I used to, but um, certainly I'm getting to the point now where the cleanup is starting to wrap up and we're starting to think about what we will rebuild. And that, that part gives me hope and it's a much more constructive and creative process to rebuild something and to rebuild a life here. It may not be what it was, but it'll be something new and different and in time um, over the next decade or two. Hard work and sweat equity, it will be something we can be proud of and we can say that's ours, we rebuilt that. Um, and hopefully it'll be, you know, if not fireproof, at least fire resilient. We as the people have to know what the environment is and how our land should be utilized and taken care of. We need to do our prayers together again. It would be Really neat to have rain and snow and all the livestock's back again. It's a hard life, but yet it is a wonderful life. And people just need to see that we all need that little bit of outreach sometimes to make it through and that there'll be better days ahead, I always say. It's, it's a human connection. It's a um, his, uh, family history connection. It's a business connection. So it encompasses uh, so much of who I am and what, what I've done. Don't give up, keep going. Because in the end, it's worth it. I mean, this is your farm. This is your legacy and hopefully People realize you didn't quit. That's what I don't. I don't quit. <laughs>
Earth Focus is made possible in part by a grant from Anne Ray Foundation, a Margaret A. Cargill philanthropy, and the Orange County Community Foundation. HASA is a proud sponsor of Earth Focus.